Let me try and connect this to a question that uh, one of the platform speakers raised yesterday. I think Meera Chandok made this point, which often gets made in such context in India, that just because we use secularism or related concepts in India and they get used in Europe, it doesn't mean that they are the same. Right? Now, it's, this is a peculiar thing to argue. You know, it seems like very obvious that there is difference. Because why, why are they different? Because national boundaries make the difference or historical periods make the difference? It's not clear at all. Actually, it's a, in some sense, uh, I think, an incoherent argument. I mean, we would not say that, say, for example, banana or gravity mean different things, as used by Europeans and, and Indians. Nobody would. Right? I mean, even if you find a new variety of banana, you'll think that, well, you know, you'll extend it to that, that variety, right? So it means that it's not a different concept. Now, this argument that somehow secularism and related concept, when the moment they come to India, become different, is ridiculous. And I take your valuable, really uh, illuminating paper to actually prove this. That is, the reason fundamentalists in, in the states and the secularists in India find themselves on the same position is not because these are different concepts, but because they're the same concepts that are, that, that are being used, used here. And I think that is a continuity. I mean, I wanted to raise this question yesterday, but I think I want uh, uh, us to sort of come back to this. Because the assumption that is being made that uh, when, when people say that there are different concepts that are being used, uh, they don't give, they don't ever give any argument. Is it just because I say secularism, uh, it makes, it, does it become different? It must be the same concept. So sometimes the people think that just the idea that it has a new meaning in India itself is something significant about it. In fact, one wants to argue that if it has acquired a new meaning, it must be because of failure of the application of the concept. That that, uh, that that it is not because you know uh, so it it, it it can't be the case that you you uh, uh, you simply say that there is a new concept of secularism here. It must be if there is an, if it has a new meaning accruing to it. That must be because somewhere it, it, it doesn't apply here. Is there a bow? I will try and finish before you interrupt me, Naomi. <laughs> You're all constructing me as a no, dominatrix. No, no, no. Love you, I love you. <laughs> love you. <laughs> uh, really, thanks a lot. It's a brilliant paper. Really enjoyed listening to you. Uh, the first and most important thing I find is to realize that Indian secularists or the fundamentalists and not the so-called Hindu fundamentalists. That's the first conclusion. Because the arguments they used, the Indian secularists, were precisely the arguments, precisely the same assumptions, precisely the same direction as the evangelical, evangelical Protestant fundamentalists in the United States. And they are not using an, aber an argument which is an aberration. In fact, it's a very sta standard Christian argument. So this is the first thing to realize. So in that sense, I guess, Hindu thought people are right when they accuse secularists of being pseudo secularists. Now, whether we would like to be a Hindu to or not is not the issue. The point is, you cannot write off these kind of criticisms as ravings of unintelligent people. All right, that's the first thing. Second point I want to emphasize, which is what Sarah made, which I would like to really reflect upon in the round table, is this. Because of the fact that Christian theology has become the framework, for discussing about the secular and the religious divide, those who do not share this framework have very great difficulty in comprehending what the debate is all about. So Indian Constituent Assembly debates, debates of today, and the, also the spontaneous aversion and incomprehension of most Indians to evangelical activities of Christian churches or the Muslim uh, mosques, has to do with the fact that we don't share that kind of a background at all, we, we meaning the, the, the rest of the world, just because of the fact that the dominant Western countries so far shared a Western Christian theological background. The third point, and I'll stop there, is I want to come back to Duncan's uh, uh, point, which I think is a very important question, again, for us to reflect upon, but one that, that uh, uh, Winnie 
suggests as a solution why it's problematic. Let's assume for a moment that the Indian state makes no regulation about conversion. Let's assume also what is going on today continues. What is going on today? Madrasas are converting. Yeah? Please don't mistake me for a Hindutva man or anything. This is a fact. And second is that there is a very militant evangelical uh, Christianity of a particular type is very active in north and north, northeast regions of India and not only there. All right. Now let's suppose the state refuses. So which means in the first instance, it must step out of the United States States, uh, United Nations Charter of Human Rights, which recognizes principle of religious freedom. But second, assume now that as a response to the militant evangelization attempts, there emerges focused response of people. Some kind of people's movement emerges. And inevitably it will take the form of clashes, including violent clashes. Should the state now legislate on it or not? If you say no, that means the state simply allows certain kinds of conflict to grow and grow and grow. But if it does interfere, it has to legislate on conversion. So the problem, in other words, it appears to me, in India especially, is a problem of two completely opposing forces. One, the Semitic religions and the native, or what I call the heathen traditions of Asia and India, where the world is experienced completely differently. And the notions of human beings are completely different. So in this sense, we have to not merely raise issues about, and I'll end it there, with secular state. We have to raise fundamental questions about what the state is in political philosophy itself. What is a state? And whether can we have a neutral state at all? So I, Duncan's dilemma is the state cannot legislate on a religious conversion issue, but the state has to legislate on the religious conversion issue. So how does one get out of this problem? I stopped it now. Thank you. Winnie, do you want to respond to any uh, of that? I just wanted to point out uh, something, uh, something interesting. I mean, if we put together Tim's remarks with your last remark, then um, what about this um, arguably, at least as pernicious, uh, effort to convert the world to capitalism? Um, you know, if, if that is um, a similar project, um, then it should be analyzed similarly, and, and therefore we should have um, laws against that, or, um, or concern about that. I mean, I think that's one of the, one of the difficulties, as, as, as your own work says. I mean, the problem with legislating against conversion efforts is that we don't know what conversion is. Yeah. Can I? Uh, I use them aloud. Sure. Anybody else? <laughs> uh, Yes, but is that, that is where, uh, see, that's where, for instance, I think one of the disagreements are between uh, Tim and me, and you. You think that it is not clear what conversion is in the United States. I beg to disagree. The problem is there is a very clear understanding of what conversion is in Christianity. It is an internal turning towards God, and it's a process of internal change, and whether it is sudden or you have to be first a Christian, is a matter of historically where you put the debate of conversion. For instance, in the Middle Ages, conversio was an asymptotic process which began from the day you're born and never reached its end until you're dead. So your whole life was one of being a Christian. Quid sit Christianum essay. What does it mean to be a Christian is one of the fundamental questions that Middle Ages and antiquity and even the early modern period asked continuously. And there is also the sudden St. Paul on his way to Damascus. You also have that moment. But that arises when it is conversion from a heathen, pagan tradition into Christianity. So for Christians, there's only one process of conversion, that is becoming a true Christian. Now, in this sense, the discussion in the United States, the discussion in terms of denominational differences, what does the born-again guy say as against a Roman Catholic? Now, this is a discussion internal to Christianity, and it's not vague at all. The problem of vagueness arises not because Christians haven't thought about it or not clear about it or there are no criteria for it. The problem arises when you secularize this fundamentally Christian idea to encompass the whole of humankind. And that is where today things are breaking down because there are intelligent, articulate heathens, not like myself. I mean, you know, not all that intelligent, so I don't think I'm talking about myself. But there are intelligent, articulate heathens 
who say, look, we also exist. We are not part of the Christian world model. We are not a part of semantic anthropology. We have our own experiences of the world. And this is where things are beginning to break down and in the United States as well. Okay. Thank you.